Afternoon guys, Dr. Ken Norberg here again, Fireside Seminar. And this one is about concealment while hunting older bucks. You know, older bucks make the requirements for concealment a lot different than almost any hunter realizes in America today. A lot of people think, oh, I'm really concealed if I get up off the ground. They don't look up there anymore. You'll, I'll show you a picture here now of a buck looking up. <laughs> they used to, people used to believe back in the 80s, whitetails couldn't look up like that, but they do. You'll see that. And not only that, uh, you know, they'll, they'll pick a tree for a stand site and they'll cut all the branches off. And uh, then the brand, they're all laying around here around that tree, you know, and then they add steps or to climb up there and they got this nice new tree stand hooked to the tree and they're sitting up there and they got everything cut off of there so they look like a bear cub hanging to a, a, a tree trunk up off the ground. And when a whitetail sees something move up there and they can see it move whether you're on the ground or 20 feet up there. And they see motion, they look at it. And that's an important uh, part of their lives. It's what helps keep them alive. And especially older bucks who are alone a lot, uh, this important part of what helps to make them become big bucks, the kind we all dream about every year. So, but most of everybody they end up not being covered at all. Their silhouette looks exactly like it belongs to a man. And uh, the tree stands now are, are seen all the time. There isn't a buck two and a half years of age or older in America today that hasn't seen tree stands and hunters in tree stands. And uh, after 35 years of millions and millions of hunters using tree stands every year, uh, we've taught our whitetails, especially older bucks, that those are dangerous, uh, something to stay away from. And they become very quick at finding those and identifying them and staying away from them. And they like tree stands in a way because once they find a hunter in a tree, it's going to be very easy for that deer to avoid that hunter and keep a safe distance away. And uh, if they haven't had reason to raise their tails and bound away snorting, uh, they'll stay in their ranges because they don't worry so much about a hunter in a tree once they figure out where he is. They'll just stay out of that area, out of sight. And monitor it every day, you know, pass downwind out of sight in heavy cover or over the top of a brow of a hill or something. Sniff the air, you know, downwind air, uh, air coming from that area. Oh yeah, he's still there. That's a place to keep, stay away from. He can, a lot of bucks will do that every single day of a hunting season, and you'll never see them. And that's one of the reasons why. Well, you know, people who manufacture these tree stands would have you believe that once you're out of the, off the ground, you can't be smelled by a deer. You know, your, your scent travels horizontal to the ground. And so deer down here, and sometimes that seems true. You, say, I, I've had plenty of deer right under my tree stand over the years. Yeah, I've been hunting deer for uh, seventy, no, sixty-six years, now, and using tree stands since well, primitive ones since the early nineteen sixties, all the way up till a few years ago. And uh, now my boys keep saying I shouldn't try climb trees anymore. But even so, I like hunting at ground level. I prefer that. But anyway, everybody wants you to believe that, that you, you can't be smelled when you're up there. But that's not true. And I've done a lot of research on this over the years. And the scents that come from you, they do more than spread horizontally in the air. They spread out as they go downwind. But they also spread vertically. And so, when you're releasing scent there, your scents are going like this. All through a big, great big area, a cone-shaped area, that touches the ground. And depending on the speed of the wind, it might touch the ground 25 yards away or maybe 50 yards away. But meanwhile, you can have deer right under you or coming at you from the sides and that can't smell you. 
But any deer that's downwind, and this thing keeps spreading out, by the time it gets 100 yards downwind, it's spreading out as much as 200 yards. Huge pie-shaped area down there, and they're going to smell you. Well, you ain't going to fool an older buck by using anything that you think is going to eliminate human odors. And uh, it's fine using those things, keeping your odors to a minimum, but after a day in the woods, you, you, you're producing a lot of odors coming from your body and your clothing and your boots and your cap and your breath and that whitetails readily smell 200 yards or more downwind. Now, a lot further than that downwind, but they don't usually react to it if they know you're about 200 yards away. They don't worry about you when they're that far away, especially in wooded areas where they can't be seen 200 yards away. Yeah, it's fine. You're out there. They like you. You're a stand hunter. You're the kind of hunter that doesn't chase them around in the woods and fire six shots at them every time you see a white tail going through the brush. They like stand hunters. But anyway, they're going to smell you anyway. So, you know, we're talking about concealment today. <laughs> and what, what most hunters don't even consider it as tree, as tree stand hunters. They end up trashing the area, cutting off branches out of a tree, you see these big white round marks on the tree where there was a branch and putting up a stand and, and maybe making a, a shooting lane off in one direction and cutting branches here and there that might be in the way and um, or creating a trail real visible, it's all nice and clean and marked with, with red uh, strips of gauze or whatever or some kind of marking material. When, it come, when an older buck comes to a place like that, particularly, and this is before the season even begins, particularly if this area, like here's a deer trail coming through here, particularly if that area and the trail where you expect the deer to come, or the feeding area or whatever, is loaded with trail scents the last four days. Yeah, I'm real concentrate. You know, this guy has been working hard to get this area all fixed up for the hunting season, but meanwhile, this is a, a heavy concentration of human tra trail scent being deposited all around the tree and the area all around it, including on the trail where you expect the deer to come. And there's hardly an older buck anywhere that doesn't readily recognize, holy cow, a human's been spending a lot of time here. Look at all these changes that have been made by a human here. This is a dangerous place to be, especially during the hunting season. Once the hunting season becomes, all that deer has to do is get one whiff of you. You know, once they learn what you smell like, uh, once they learn what you look like, the way you hunt, where you hunt, the trails you use, the stand sites you use, those bucks never forget it for the rest of their lives. Every year when you come back, as soon as they detect that sound they heard is made by you, that cough or the way you blow your nose in the morning when you get up in your camp, or the sound of your ATV coming and then stopping ominously a little ways away, or the sounds of your footsteps as you're approaching him, that does it. That's him. He's the one that sits over in this tree stand here, and he's been doing that again. He's got all kinds of orders over there. Boy, it's just so easy for a big, experienced buck to avoid you, because rather than making yourself concealed, you're making it easier, easier, and easier for them to find you and identify you and avoid you for the rest of the hunting season. Isn't that awful? You can take fawns and yearlings and does and, and maybe a deer every year, antlerless deer or real young bucks, by doing what most hunters do every year and using the same stand site year after year. But it doesn't work for older bucks. I mean, you have to be just plain lucky, and you won't be just plain lucky more than a couple of times in your lifetime of hunting whitetails by doing this. That's terrible. Bull hunting, gun hunting, it's terrible. I'm sorry to tell you. But I've known that a long time. And uh, so uh, I've been doing things for a long time and doing a lot of research for a long time to try to figure out better ways to hunt whitetails, but number one of the things on my list, whenever I'm out there looking for stand sites, whether before a season for opening weekend hunting, 
or drenching for every day after that. Uh, when I'm along certain designated trails looking for fresh tracks and droppings of a big buck each day during the lane season, so I can always be close to them every half day I hunt. But anyway, uh, first thing I think about is concealment. If I don't have good concealment all the way to my stand, or concealment while I'm climbing up there, or concealment when I'm sitting up there, I want nothing to do with that stance. I, no way. You can't make me hunt that kind of a spot ever. I just won't do it. It's a complete waste of time. I might as well be playing solitaire back in camp, being, doing something like that. Because if I'm going to hunt big bucks, none of this kind of stuff is going to exist around my stance sites. Nothing. My best stance sites today are natural, unaltered cover. Bushes, trees, grasses, uh, fallen trees, all kinds of things like that. Rocks, boulders, <laughs> uh, big tree trunks. Uh, those things, unaltered, are the very best stand sites for hunting older bucks. Things that aren't different. Whether the buck comes along that spot, you get, let's say you went out to two weeks early, it's oh man, I like this spot. This stock, this spot is is big buck effective. And you know what is that again? We know we mentioned that last. Time. Let's say over here in this area beyond you here is a big feeding area. Well, big feeding areas can be dynamite places to hunt if it's currently a favorite buck feeding area or a favorite feeding area of a doe in heat. Yeah, boy, you got either of those going on here. Like, And how do you know that? Well, you find all kinds of fresh and old tracks of a big buck in that feeding area and droppings, big droppings, like, you know, three quarters of an inch to an inch long, shiny ones, and then old ones, too, that indicate, wow, this guy has been coming here a lot. And, and the fresh ones, really fresh tracks and drops there. He's feeding here right now. But you got to think a little bit more than that. Now, where I hunt, on November, well, the uh, second week in November, you know, the seventh day in November, or eighth, right there, though all the bucks living in my hunting area are going to switch from eating grasses and green leaves and things of that sort and start eating browse, uh, woody stems and buds of woody shrubs. Most of them not too tall, four or six feet tall, but, and particularly where I hunt, uh, red woody stems, uh, red stems of, of red osiers or red bark dogwoods, which are wild plants, and, or um, sugar maple saplings, where there's a lot of logging and you got a lot of sugar maples. You get all kinds of saplings coming up out of the stumps and they're red and oh, white tails love them. They, they just crowd those areas. Well, another thing that might be happening at the same time, you might have a place where there's a whole big stand of red oaks over here and you had a bumper crop of acorns that year. Well, that would be a dynamite spot as well. Now, what, what, or a bedding area or watering spot, those are lesser, but they can be awfully good too. But anyway, what I'm thinking about when I pick a stand site is, is that buck going to return here often? Not just once now and no more for the rest of the year. I want a, I want a spot where I can be fairly certain that buck is going to show up there opening weekend. You know, opening morning, maybe second morning or in the evening. But I want to be fairly certain of that. And uh, not only that, I want lots of spots like that. that because I know big bucks, they're, they're so good at finding stand hunters and other hunters, uh, especially if they're moving on foot, that uh, most stands, when you're hunting big bucks, are only good for one half to one day of hunting, period. Sometimes they're good for four or five days later, but that's it for the hunting season. Almost every stand site we use during the hunting season, my three sons and I, we'll only use one half day a year. Because we are already thinking, if we sat there all morning and didn't see a buck, it meant the buck knows we're there. He already knows they're there. 
and he's already keeping away from this spot. And this would be a lousy place to sit the rest of the hunting season. So you go on to another spot in the afternoon or tomorrow morning, like that. And every time you move, it's like opening morning all over again. How about that? You like to have opening morning all over again every day you hunt? You can do that if you do it right. And, and you use proper concealment. So anyway, yeah, I'm talking about a lot of things that hunters do that are really wrong when you're hunting older bucks. So we'll talk more about concealment here now. And you know, concealment is more than proper concealment is more than keeping from being seen. It's also doing things to keep from being heard or smelled. Well, standing is a good way to keep from being heard because you're sitting up there real quiet. But one of the big problems with stand hunting is, generally, or it should be that way, that here I am in camp and my stand set I want to be in today is half mile over that way or maybe a mile over that way. My big challenge is going to be this morning to get there without the buck knowing it. If he knows I'm there, I'm not going to see him that day. i got to be able to get there without him knowing it. And number one, like I say, in my mind is I gotta have proper concealment all the way to that stand site. It's gonna I want don't want to be easily seen by that buck, or at least within a hundred yards of that stand line. I want to be well concealed by natural cover along the way. And we use deer trails to get to where we're going. And that works good. That works very good because you don't have to do a lot of work to create the trail just pick up, throw dead branches off of it, so it'll be a little cleaner so you aren't stepping on branches that break underfoot the whole way out there in the morning, you know, out there quietly, but we, we don't do that when a, when a buck comes close to our stance there, which is well concealed to start with, he's not going to find any big man-made trails out there with all these markers and branches laying around, things like that. It's just another deer trail to him. Nothing there to make him believe that uh, this is going to be a dangerous place during the hunting season, or it is a dangerous place today. You know, uh, all, all those other things are not there. Like I say, nothing there that will be uh, spotted by a buck that's approaching your stand site. And believe me, they're looking for all these characteristics of American stand hunters' uh, stand sites today, when, they're, when the hunting scene is on, especially. And they, they see that, or they find that big concentration of human trail sense in one area, things like that. Those are spots that Buck is going to start avoiding right now until the hunting season is over. He might even abandon his range uh, and, and migrate to some posted land miles away and stay there the whole time until there's no more gunshots heard in the woods and come back. Or he might become nocturnal, uh, move at night time only, he just doesn't move at all during the day and boy you can't hunt a buck like that. You, know, you don't have much of a chance of taking them. So there's things they can do that can be pretty drastic but when you're standing or doing things properly the only area they're going to avoid once they find you is only about uh, a circle with a radius of about 100 yards in their home range. Yeah, you're going to stay out of there. But all the rest of that square mile in this area, they're going to use every day. Not every trail, any, you know, trails that are not close to feeding areas or watering spots or, or, or bedding areas don't impress me one bit. I don't care what you see on the trail, how fresh the tracks are and that kind of thing. If it's not close to a spot where I figure that buck has just got to come, he's got to eat or it's got a water, or it's got a bed, if it's not close to a spot like that, he can go dozens of different, take different routes to get there every day, depending on wind direction and where he's found hunters, he'll stay away from that area, and, or he'll find a trail all laced with your fresh orders. A lot of bucks will stay away from that, especially if it's new. Sometimes they'll get to the point where they say, well, he goes by here hour before sunrise in the morning, and doesn't go back until noon. I can walk on this trail 9, 10 o'clock and not worry about him because he, he's so reliable, he's so predictable well, that way. That kind of thing can happen. But the bucks we hunt 
uh, you know, that they're sharp. They'll find us so many times during the hunting season, and sometimes they're just lucky that way. And big bucks tend to be lucky that way. But uh, eventually, sooner or later, maybe 9 o'clock opening morning or the last morning on, uh, of your hunt, you're going to see a big buck real close to where you're stand hunting, and he doesn't know you're there. And you're going to have an easy chance to take a standing or slowly moving big buck from your stand sign. That's, that's the goal we all have, my sons and I have every year. And it's worked so well on us, for us, that like I said before, I feel like I'm bragging when I say it. I am. Uh, we've taken 106 of them in the last 31 years. Now, let's get back to concealment, uh, visual con concealment. Now, I started to tell you that about walking to, a, talking about walking to and from your stand sign. Or when you learn how to hunt the way we hunt, you're going to be searching for very fresh tracks or droppings of a, of a big buck in your hunting area every day starting about day three during the hunting season along certain designated trails. You don't wander through the woods doing this. You just go on certain uh, big slurps, looping trail in your hunting area, nowhere else. In fact, when during the hunting season, you don't use any trail except those that go to your stand sites, usually branching off this circular one I'm telling you about. The circular one I've talked about before, we call them our cruise trails. But those are the only trails we use during the hunting season, so deer have got all kinds of area that they're not bothered. And that might bug you, say, after all, I'm here to hunt deer, but they stay there. And so your odds of taking a big buck increase hugely because you do that. It's one of those important steps to improve your odds. But anyway, but the worst time for you as a stander, the, the time when you're most likely to ruin your hunt, uh, make those big bucks uh, uh, abandon their home range or become nocturnal. It's while you're walking to and from a stand site, whether in the dark, early in the morning, or in the afternoon, going out there for the evening. Those are the times that you're most likely to really goof things up. That's because while you're up and about and moving like that, you're most easy to spot in the woods. You know, Maybe little openings where a white tail's laying in his bed or he's feeding, uh, who's going to see you. A little thing, but maybe not enough to know what you are. He's wondering maybe you're a moose or another deer or maybe a wolf. Huh? But something over there is sizable moved over there. But don't know what it is. White tails won't run away when on that evidence alone, and so you that's why you want to be well hidden on the way there. And then you want to be well hidden if you're going to climb up the tree. You don't want to cut all those branches off. You want you don't want your silhouette obvious, and, and you're making noise then, and you're doing that usually, and uh, especially if the bark is rough on the tree. But anyway. Uh, and then you want to be well hidden when you're sitting in the tree because you don't want your body to be obviously the body of a human. It's so easy to see because, uh, and identify because it's so big and no other creature in the woods has, an, uh, has a, a silhouette like a human. And we walk around our hind legs and all that kind of stuff, short neck, no big ears, all those things. We're human. So you don't want a buck to know that. So anyway, good cover all the way to the stand side. Now, but let's talk about this walking business, because, you know, like, let's, let's say midday you're searching for very fresh tracks or droppings of a big buck heading toward uh, a feeding area, or heading away from it, or back to a known feeding area, over, or back to its bedding area, or to a water spot. You're looking for tracks like that, at places where you know they're going to come back, and or you're fairly certain they are. And, uh, so, you're looking for that, and when you're walking in this circle, you're going to be going upwind, downwind, crosswind, and all kinds of wind direction. You can't be concerned about wind direction when you're doing it, and you don't have to be. You can do walk to and from stand sites and search for fresh signs of a big buck every day of a season without alarming whitetails when they can abandon their ranges or change their habits and behavior. You can do that. 
Now, a lot, their guys just refuse to believe that. And if they refuse to believe, that's fine. But if you want to have much better buck hunting and want to improve your odds of taking big bucks, believe this. Now, I've talked about this a little bit before, but I'm going to tell you how I learned this. You know, what you can do when you're walking. It was from watching wolves. You know, you don't walk in the woods where wolves live and expect to see wolves every day. They're all around you and they're hunting and doing You don't. Because until they become used to you there, you know, to seeing there on the ranges, and they decide you're harmless, you don't hurt wolves, you don't see them. They're really, yeah, in, in the past they've been mostly nocturnal anyway while they're hunting. They don't move around much during the daytime, although that's changed and I won't get into why, but it has. They're hunting day and night nowadays because they don't have enough food and not enough deer. <laughs> like in our hunting area where there's only three deer left per square mile now, where there used to be 22. And lots of wolves, all over by wolves. But anyway, um, so when you're walking, like I say, you're easiest to see, and easiest to hear, and easiest to smell, and easiest to identify from great distances. You, you walk over a ridge over there, and a deer over here, Phoenix alone, there comes a human. And one of, the, one of the days, nowadays, that makes it really easy to hear you is that they'll be out there early in the morning. They start, feed, got up about four in the morning, and they're out there feeding before first light in the morning already. And, and pretty soon they hear this engine coming <laughs> in their direction. It's an ATV or an OHV or whatever you want to call it, an off trail vehicle. They hear this engine coming closer and closer and closer. And now it's pretty close. And it stops making noise right over there. Now, every big buck in the woods knows what that means. <laughs> There's going to be a hunter in this area in minutes. Time to get out of here. Sneak away now, quietly. They know. Older does even know them. So that, that's a terrible, that sound they can hear that a mile, miles away coming. And here it comes and all of a sudden it's silent. That's, that's scary to a deer. So they hear that coming, but there's all kinds of ways they can hear you. They can hear your footsteps. Now you might think, wow, my footsteps sound, I, my footsteps sound like I'm a feeding deer. I, you know, walk a few steps and stop, you know, and then go a little further and listen and look around and real careful, sneak, you know. No, if they hear me, they think I'm a feeding deer. Well, you know, we've all been taught that. I don't know who ever got the idea that that actually works. And maybe there are people with moccasins on back in the you know, 1600s who learned from some Indians up in, in Maine or somewhere that, yeah, you can miss how much deer when you creep along like they do in their stockings, in their, in their leather footsteps and that kind of thing. close enough to shoot them with a bull. But we got these big heavy hoots with stiff soles on them and we go crunching through the snow and the gravel and the grass and stepping on branches and all that kind of thing. There's no way in the earth you can walk through the woods and make deer think that that thing with those big feet that are making crunching noise and breaking all those branches is a deer. Whether it stops or not, you're crazy. What you're doing when you stop often while well, going to a stand site to look around and listen. It's you're sounding like a large predator uh, sneaking up on a deer. That kind of sound is scary to whitetails. They don't, they, that's a terrible sound. It's going to make the whitetails around your stand site and on the way. Let's get out of here. Let's stay away from here today or maybe for the next four days or whatever. But anyway, that's scary stuff. If you want to, I learned from wolves. Wolves had that problem too, I suppose, from a long ago, maybe centuries ago. They learned that sneaking, you know, going along while they're looking for deer like that, and sneaking and stopping off and then looking around, is not a good way to find a, um, a uh, prey, a, a, a deer that's been slowed for some reason, one a deer that's easy to catch. You know, whitetails can run faster than a wolf, not a lot faster, but 
a little bit faster, but what the, the whitetails have an advantage because they can get going fast as possible and they can leap over obstacles 25 feet across and 8 feet in the air and the wolves got to go around them. So whitetails in forest regions can quickly uh, outrun wolves. So the wolves have learned better ways to get close to whitetails and take whitetails. They have special hunting the way they like to hunt. I'm not going to go into that, but but in watching our wolves, when we first start hunting in this area up near the Canadian border, we see a long file of these big wolf packs. There are up to a dozen wolves in there, including a couple of young, going by early in the morning before first light. There they go like phantoms, and they're walking along these special trails. They had certain trails they liked to follow. We, they, I call them their cruise trails. And I watch them walk right by deer over and over again and think, what in the heck's going on here? Because those deer wouldn't move. They just stand there and watch them go by. And I thought, that's really strange. You'd think they'd run every time they see a wolf, but they don't. Because our deer have learned not to be fearful of a wolf that's not hunting, or not obviously hunting, or, they, or the, the deer has not been selected as a prey. And wolves have learned that too. And what they do when they're searching is walk single file like that at a moderate pace along a trail, a deer trail probably, which is gives them a predictable direction. You know, a deer goes along the line of the trail, it's going to go over there. Or the wolves don't turn their heads while they're doing this. Uh, they just march right on by. They, they're selecting a vulnerable deer by scent alone. Uh, they just march along at a moderate pace, keeping their heads pointed straight ahead. And actually, they might have, a, in the process, select a deer that they smell, the airborne odors of a deer, or the trail scents of the deer. They don't stop and poke their nose in the tracks or look over there where the deer went. They just keep going right on by until they're out of sight, crosswind, or downwind somewhere. Then they get organized to set up a special way of hunting deer. And, you know, after I saw that happening several times and found evidences of this happening in footprints in snow, uh, my wife and I started trying that out. You know, we'd see some deer on this backwards road, you know, and there's deer looking at binoculars, and there's a couple laying down close to the road up there. Let's try this wolf ruse, this trick that wolves use. And so we get out and say, our camera set and start walking, not looking there, just walking a modern pace like, we don't know there's any deer anywhere around here, and we're not interested in them anyway, only interested in way down on the other end of the road there somewhere. And by golly, that worked. We got so many close-ups, full-frame pictures of deer doing that. We'd be all set. We'd get there and stop, turn, click. <laughs> and the next picture would be deer bombing off through the woods. So, but it worked. And when that worked, then we started using this same technique, this wolf roost, when traveling to and from stand signs. And that works. Man, does that improve the odds that you're going to see it see deer or a big buck at your stand sign because when you, you it's really difficult it, it may be impossible for you to walk within one to two hundred yards of a, of a big buck without the buck knowing that's a human but if while you're going there you're acting as if hunting or actually you're actually when you're stopping and looking around and going a little bit that's a hunting human. <laughs> now, there's a difference between a human that's not hunting and not like the wolves. You know, if you're hunting, well, they don't want to be anywhere around here. They're going to get out of there. But if you're not hunting, just walking straight along in a manner, but not in a big hurry, but just walk along a predictable trail, keeping your head pointed straight ahead. Just keep going right to your stand site. You aren't going to you aren't going to alarm any deer along the way enough to make them abandon the area. Even at the feeding area, now you get deer out in front of you there. Oh, I would say most of the time, those deer, if they're nearby, they heard you. Uh, even if you're trying to be very quiet, stepping softly, which you should do as you go, uh, they heard you. But they, as long as they couldn't see you, and as long as you move like that, uh, they may suspect you're a human, all right, but you're not hunting, or you're nothing to worry about, as long as you keep safe distance. So they're going to be suspicious for a while. That would sound like it could be a human, all right? 
and then you get to the stand site, you sit down, and if nothing more happens, they don't hear or smell or, or, or see anything that indicates you're the only one ever even in the area anymore. Maybe you went away, you know, without them hearing. Well, they're going to leave the area and they're going to start resuming feeding, and that's when we usually get our deer. And that usually starts around one half hour before first light in the morning because we time our hikes to our stand sites to be ready to hunt the first moment that becomes legal during the day to fire a gun at deer or a bull, a half hour before sunrise. So that's why we do it, things that way, you see? And those, that's, those things we've been talking about at this point, you know, avoiding making all this damage and it stands like so, like somebody, so many people do. Uh, avoiding hiding your silhouette when walking or sitting or climbing. All those things, and when you don't do that, you're opening yourself up to failure year after year after year. And then if you keep hunting the same stand set, you're also opening yourself to failure because those bucks find you so soon, and the more time you sit there, the less, you know, once he's fed you there, you, you, you're not going to see that buck. You might hear something in the woods, you'll sound like a deer walking over there, but you won't see it. And um, so, no, th those are, what I'm talking about is things you do to greatly improve your odds of taking up a, a big buck. So, anyway, next time we'll be talking about uh, avoiding being smell. Now, we talked about a bunch of that already, but I'm gonna go, we're going to go into greater detail about that. Uh, on my next uh, seminar about, about uh, being concealed. And so that's going to be an important one. You know, what you're learning here now, you know, they sure it's different. But by golly, I got 31 years of, of becoming fully aware of the fact that these things work. Now, if you're afraid to go out there in the dark in the morning and you come up with all these rationalizations about why you don't want to go out there in the dark, well then forget it. You, you just don't have this advantage that most of us have. Uh, if you don't know about uh, how to make sure you get there in the dark without becoming lost, that's too bad. That's, uh, if you think that just because they hear your footsteps they're going to run away and you'll never see them all day, that's not true either. It's the way you walk that makes the difference. And so, if you don't want to believe that, that's all right too. So uh, keep doing the things the way you are. But though you guys that take this seriously, uh, and, and boy, you know, I told you we got about 30 different things we do every year to improve our odds of taking a big buck. So what have we got now? Two or three of them so far. <laughs> and when you once you've got all of these figured out and using them whenever it's you know, something that seems you should do, you know, sometimes you can't use all 30, but of course. But always get the most important ones, for sure, and then, you know, concealment is really, really important for hunting big bucks. And of course, when you do that, you know, you may fool other deer by not doing that, but when you do this, you see a lot more deer. And a lot of those deer, especially does, whether in here or not, are great decoys of big bucks, and that's another thing that improves your odds of taking older bucks. So keep that in mind, you know, what we're, you're learning right now is so important to buck hunting. And the nice thing about it is what you're learning now, whitetails, whether they know you do these things or not, our whitetails know we're doing this all the time, it must be kind of exasperating to them. Because we keep showing up close to where they are. You wonder, how do they do that? But sooner or later, uh, unless it, the buck becomes nocturnal or, or abandons the entire area for the rest of the hunting season, you're going to see that buck and, and it, before he knows you're anywhere near. And, and in that case, he's going to be walking slowly or, or stopping to take a bite of food or feeding or something like that really easy shot. So, these are things that we do all the time. And you know, White Tail is so excited <laughs> we are able to do this and to be successful. 
And whereas that, nowadays, where we've been successful every year, my three boys and I for 30 years, it's gotten to the point now where it's going to be really hard for us to do that because we got so few deer there. But we love the area and we found some more big bucks to hunt this year already. The spring started. Uh, we wouldn't change it for the world. And uh, Deep Wilderness area and our little village out there that's completely self-sufficient every year for a couple of weeks, that's, that's really great. So uh, anyway, where you hunt, you have a lot more deer than we do, and your odds are going to be much better than ours for taking a big buck each year. You can do it every year, or almost every, maybe nine out of ten years, something like that, but most of them. And let me remind you now, gee, you know, you're, you're hearing this now in July. Uh, in a couple months, it'll be time to thinking, start thinking seriously about white on. And if this is your year to be serious about taking a big buck, it's time you start learning everything you need to know to be able to do it successfully. And there's no better source, one source of material of what, for what you need to know than my newest book, my Whitetail Hunter's Almanac 10th edition. Now, early editions, they were smaller books, and they each covered one or more different subjects. But this one is, it all, it covers everything you need to know, that big, that big 10th edition. So if you haven't done that, um, think, try to order it soon. <laughs> and, and also the bear book. You know, I'll be bearing in a lot of states starts September 1st. That's not so far away. And bear hunting for trophy bears is like uh, deer hunting for trophy bucks. There's so much you need to learn or you're doomed to failure every year. But older bears are tougher to hunt than older bucks if you don't know what to do, how to do it. As a result of studying black bears for many years, I uh, wrote and published my first bear book in 1990. And that book <coughs> was a bestseller right away and uh, became known as the Bear Hunter's Bible because if you did what was told you to do in that book, you'd get a bear every time, <laughs> which was really amazing. Well, bears started to learn to counter the things us bear hunters were doing, and so I wrote a revised edition in 2001. And since then, I've revised it a couple more times, and uh, a couple years ago, I, I published my newest edition, uh, much revised, uh, and uh, the companion book to my White Iron Almanac 10th edition, big book, all kinds of stuff in it. Well, which covers just about everything black bears are doing nowadays to avoid hunters. So order that bear book too if you're going to hunt bears this year or in the future. So thanks again guys. Uh, be sure to subscribe and hit that thumbs up button down below, favor to me, and I'll see you again soon. Be sure to visit my website. Here's the link. Here you'll find links to my blog posts, my Twitter account, my YouTube account, my Amazon store with links to my ebooks. My son's eBay store, a money saver if you're ordering from Canada or other countries. My website bookstore and much more.